thank you for the opportunity to present my work in this nice workshop in this nice seminar and yeah also thanks for the participants for showing up yeah i want to speak about equidistribution in our care theory and um, as a motivating example i want to uh, discuss first equidistribution of zero sets of polynomials of integer polynomials and to motivate again this i want to recall Beadle's equidistribution result on uh, on integer polynomials and to go this let us first define the canonical height of an integer polynomial with yeah leading coefficient a n and zeros alpha j and classically this is also the zero uh, the height of of the zeros of alpha j if p is not irreducible if, if p is irreducible sorry and it's just defined as one over n of the logarithm of the absolute value of the leading term plus one over n of the sum of the logarithms of the um, absolute values of the zeros which have absolute value at least one and then the theorem by below is that if you take a sequence of of non-zero integer polynomials which uh, such as the height is going to zero and the zeros of each pn are pairwise different and if you take mu s1 to be the normed harm measure on the circle s1 and c then for any test function from c to c which is continuous you get that yeah the zeros are for n to infinity is distributed like the harm measure on s1 meaning that uh, if you evaluate f on the average of of its of the zeros of pn then for n to infinity this is the same as the integral over s1 with respect to the harm measure yeah and we can now ask some questions first one is what happens if the canonical height is not tending to zero and the other one would be um yeah if we allow also that the high is not going to zero can we reach something like equidistribution on the whole complex plane instead of only as one which would be interesting but to do this yeah we need some uh some measure on c which is which is finite volume and then it's better to to work with the compact space we go we choose the project line nine and there we have the fubini study metric so i want to introduce it so the perfect projective line defined over the integers is just p1 z and we take some homogeneous coordinates z0 and z1 on the product line then uh, we have the global sections of this product line of the line bundle on it's just uh, um, homogeneous polynomials in the homogeneous coordinates of degree n and we can ident identify them with uh, this polynomial polynomials in de of degree n and the zero polynomial just for example by setting z1 to b1 and if you tensor with the complex numbers we get the the se global sections of p1 over c it's, it's the same and we can again identify with polynomials or with complex um, coefficients so now let me motivate the Fubini study metric where if you have a global section of on over the complex numbers the idea is to to define a norm on this and it should be a yeah function from p1 over c to the non additive real numbers and what one can do is okay just takes the absolute value but then it's not well defined because it's depending on um yeah zero one and zero is z zero and zero z one are only um, homogeneous coordinates so we are only interested in, in in the equivalence classes modulo um multiplicities so we have to divide out some factors and if n is one this canonical choice of such a factor is takes the square of the absolute value of z0 and this plus the square of the absolute value of z1 and on the tensor product of o1 so on we want that this is compatible with with multiplication so, and then we have to take the nth power of this okay this is a good choice and then we can compute the curvature of this metric on on or y or one 
And if we try to compute it with respect to the coordinate Z defined by Z0 divided by Z1 on the complex numbers, which is isomorphic to the space where Z1 is not non-vanishing, it's a Sariski open subset of P1C, then uh, C1 oh, well, of O1 is by definition just the uh, DD bar over 2 pi i, the logarithm of the Z1, the Fubini Sudi metric of Z1. And one can explicitly compute it in the coordinate Z. Yeah, it's that what written there. And if one studies this farther, then uh, yeah, replacing DZ by a real and imaginary part, one checks directly that the I cancels out and we get some positive form. So now the idea is that we want to study um, good heights for polynomials such that we get equal distribution with respect to this to this Fubini study measure C1 of O1. Um, yeah, that's what we're doing next. Next, we choose a non-zero section S of O1, and we associate the Fubini study height and the Bombieri height by the following integrals. The first one we're doing is the Fubini study height is just one over n of the integral of the logarithm of the metric, the Fubini study metric of S, and we add in half. So it will be clear later why we normalize it by adding a half. And for the Bombieri height, also the name of the Bombieri height will be clear later. It's just the other way around. We first take the logarithm of the integral of the um, so we first take the integral and then of this logarithm. So it's the logarithm of the L2 norm with respect to the Fubini Studi metric. And yeah, again, as I said, we can um, identify sections with polynomials and vice versa. So if you have a polynomial P, then we can write it down and explicitly by coefficients. And we associate the sections as P having the same coefficients. And then we said that the Fubini study height of the polynomial is just the same as the Fubini study height of the section SP and the same for the Bombieri norm, uh, for the Bombieri height. So uh, now let me give you explicit formulas for these. Well, if you have a polynomial with coefficients a, j, so the leading coefficient is a, n, and we have, uh, we have zero alpha j. Then the di direct computation shows us that the Fubini study height of P is just this term. Again, one over N of the logarithm of the norm of the, the absolute value of the leading coefficient plus one over two N of the sum of, now it's logarithm of one plus the absolute value of, um, of the zeros. And it's similar to the canonical height with the difference that we have not the maximum of one and this alpha j, we just take the, the, the sum of both. And that's uh, the justification for the, also for the name Fubini study high because uh, terms like these, um, one plus alpha j absolute value squared is, is what you're usually getting if you're playing with the Fubini study metric. And it's also justification for adding a half before, because now the half is, is vanishing, we have only this clear formula. And for the Bombieri height, we get that it's um, one over two n of the logarithm of the average of the coefficients weighted by the binomials n over j. So it's that is what is classically called the um, Bombieri norm, and that's why I'm calling this Bombieri height. And more generally, if P is just some real, at least one, we can define the P Bombieri height. Yeah, as usual, we take in the sum, the sum to the power P, and then we take the P root, or after the logarithm, we divide by P. And for P is infinity, we get the same with just the logarithm of, a, of the maximum of all these values of the absolute value aj weighted by the square roots of the binomials. 
So, and then we have some relations between the Bombieri and the Fubini studiohide because we have the Jensen's inequality. Remember that uh, Fubini studiohide was defined as the integral of the logarithm, and the Bombieri height was defined as the logarithm of the integral. And the Jensen's inequality shows then that, yeah, the first one, okay, we had this um, normalization by n half. So if you take the Fubini studiohide of, of p, Minus half, and it's really the integral of the logarithm is smaller than the Bombieri height. And we can, can again apply Jensen's inequality to show that it's also smaller equal to the Bombieri height uh, respect, with respect to this p, if p is at least two. Okay, and now let me come to my result for integer polynomials. So we again choose a p just as above and some uh, test function. So f is from c to c, a continuous function such that the limit of f of z for z going to infinity is well defined and finite. That this meaning that um, f can be continued to a, a continuous function on on p one, which is yeah, which is bounded. Um, so in the first assertion, we choose a uh, sequence of non-zero. Here we can even take complex polynomials that don't have to have integer coefficients. And we um, assume that the limit of the difference of the Bombieri p no height of pn and the Fubini studio height pn plus and half is going to zero. So we already know that this term the bracket is always um, yeah non negative and we are assuming that it's going to the smallest possible value in the in the limit then it holds that we get the, the equidistribution similar to Pilo's result but now we have equidistribution with respect to the Fubini study measure so meaning that the the average of f in the um, of in the zeros of the polynomial pn counted with multiplicity is going for n to infinity to the integral of f with respect to the Fubini study measure. And the second assertion is that we now additionally take a sequence of reals which has um, smallest limit point which is positive and the highest um, limit point is, is, at, is still finite or so it's bounded. And um, we set Pn for a set of polynomials with integer um, coefficients of degree n, and the p Bombieri norm is bounded by this sequence Rn. Then it holds first that yeah, the, the difference of height we considered in, in A in the average is going to zero. But this meaning because um, we have a sum of non negative values going to zero, meaning that it's uh, going to zero for almost all, whatever this means in this setup, for almost all sequences in this PN. And the second assertion is then we can apply the, the, the assertion of A to get that um, on average, we have that, uh, we have this equidistribution property for yeah for almost all sequences in these sets pn okay yeah what i want to do is now i want to prove a and the proof of a will also show how you can get from b1 to b2 it's the same strategy but um B1, I don't want to prove B1 directly, but I want to show later in a more general setup of our chaos theory how one can generalize B1 and then prove it also. So the proof of A and then also of B1 to B2 is that um, we can first rescale the polynomials such that um, of the other side section SPN, the supremum norm, is exactly one. So just multiply by some constant. So as I said, these are complex polynomials. So this 
nothing about integral numbers. Um, and then we want to bound this, um, yeah, this difference, the absolute value of this difference. And first, yeah, rewrite it. The first thing is that the first sum is just the integral over, over the divisor of this SPN. This, the divisor of SPN is the same as zero of PN. And the second integral is just the integral with respect to the C1 of R1. It's the Fubini Studi measure. And we can put it together and integrate with respect to the delta Dirac measure of this divisor minus the C1 of ON. No, now it's ON because we divide by, uh, we multiply with one over N for both terms. But um, yeah, this form we're integrating with is exactly the same as the DD bar of the logarithm of the section SPN of the Fubini study metric. And now we can apply Stokes theorem to put the DD bar from the one side to the other side. So we get that this is equal to the integral, the absolute value of the integral of the logarithm SPN with the Fubini study metric times the DD bar of F. And now we can bound this by applying the triangle inequality for integrals to get the absolute value inside. And yeah, it's also multiplicative. And now the idea is that the absolute value of dd bar of f can be bounded from if above by the c1 of r1 because c1 or r1 is, is positive and p1 is, is compact. So it says uh, there has to be an uh, constant such that we can bounce this dd bar f by this co constant times c101 and also the absolute value of this logarithm of spn can be bound is just the same as minus the logarithm of spn because we assumed before that the supremum is x is exactly one and so this uh, the, the fubini study metric of spn is always um at most one, so the logarithm of it is uh, always an additive. Yeah, and this is exactly minus the Fubini Studi height by definition of this PN plus and half. And we can add just as we want the logarithm of the supremum of uh, SPN because we set it to be, yeah, the supremum norm is one, so the logarithm is zero. But the supremum norm is more uh, up to an linear term in N is the same as L2 norm. We get that if this is the same as uh, we can replace it by the P Bombieri norm of Pn. Um, and then we have to add some log N term. Yeah, but it's fine. And then, yeah, the first term here, so the bracket is exactly what we assume to go to zero. And the second term, we have uh, log n divided by n. It's also going to zero for n to infinity. So it's completely going to zero. Ah, this is showing that if, if we, assuming that this bracket in the last line is going to zero, then um, the first term in this calculation has to go to zero. That's meaning that for these polynomials, we get this accurate distribution. Now let me um, go for the generalization to, to Hermitian line bundles on arithmetic varieties. So it's, it's really now our Kato theory. Let me recall some, um, some notions. First, an arithmetic variety is X over Z. It's an integral scheme, absolutely. And over Z, it has to be uh, um, to have nice properties like any variety it should be very projective flat or finite and separated and we assume that uh, the generic fiber x tensored with q should be smooth so it says the advantage that uh, also x tensored with c is smooth and then we can do complex analysis on the generic fiber and for example we can choose p1z which we already studied before and this would be yeah, the special case for our 
theorem will be then um, the theorem about the polynomials. Now on this, we can have Hermitian line bundles. Hermitian line bundles are pairs of a line bundle on X and a system of Hermitian matrix HX on the fibers LX, where X is running through all complex points of the arithmetic variety. And there's some um, assumption we're doing. Uh, it's not any system. We, we assume that if you have a section on some Sariski open subset U, then the norm of Sx, which square is, well, which is just uh, yeah the self product in the Sermitian metric at X, should be smooth in the point X on the complex points of U. And we get also the curvature form, which is, yeah, as before, it's just the DD bar divided by two pi i of the logarithm of the norm of S square. So this is defined locally when S is invertible, but by choosing another S, we can define it globally. And an example is, uh, yeah, just take the O1 on P1Z and equip it with a Fubini study matrix. But in general, this will not be enough for us because uh, yeah, we, we will see later. But what we can also do is multiply I as a metric on it by, by E to the minus epsilon. And this is written as yeah, O1 bar and then by a shift up by epsilon. So the metric on S is just the, meet, the Fubini study metric on S times E to the minus epsilon. And then we come to small sections. The section is called small, respectively strictly small. It's the supremum norm. So the supremum of S over all complex points is um, at most one, or it's strictly small if it's strictly smaller than one. And then the small sections form a finite set. So the small, uh, the, the global sections H0XL are a discrete set in some real vector space. And if we bound some norm, we get a finite set. And supreme norm, yes, is a norm. And yeah, we can also say that this set is playing the role of global sections on the arithmetic. Because yeah, what we are interested in in our chaos theory is that um, to get an idea of the complete completion of the spectrum of that, and there is not really completion, so, there's one point missing, the point at infinity, but in the um, set of schemes, it does not make any sense. But what you can do is to think of it always by putting metrics on everything we're doing. And um, then one has to change notions a bit. For example, the global sections are then replaced by these small sections. And also the for, for ampleness, we have some new notion which should be uh, think of a parallel of the classical ampleness. So an emission line bundle is called arithmetically ample if it's relatively ample on X over Z. So it's it's a vertical condition over each fiber. So over the fiber at infinity, so the hypothetical fiber should also be ample. This meaning just curvature form is positive. And then we need some horizontal condition to be ample, and that's doing by the following. If for P high enough, the set of global sections um, of the tensor power of the P tensor power of L should be generated by strictly small sections. So as classically, ample bundles are characterized by that for a high enough tensor power, um, it's uh, generated by global sections, yes. And an example is exactly the O1 bar um, shift, shifted by epsilon is arithmetically ample for every positive epsilon. The first, of, of course, O1 is ample on P1z. The C1 form of O1 bar shifted by epsilon is the same as the C1 of O1 because epsilon is a constant. If you take the logarithm, it's an addition an additive constant and then taking dd bar it does not matter and we are already seen that the c101 is positive and the third is a bit the yeah the most non-trivial part so the z 
zero to the j times the one to the p minus j are the are basis of the um, global forms of l of the piece tensor power of l. If it computes a supremum norm, it's just yes, we have to multiply by e to the minus two epsilon times p because it's a piece tensor power. And then the supremum of this um, Fubini Studi metric. And one can check that the supremum is at most one. And then we get it smaller equal to e minus two epsilon p, but it can be one. And that's why we really need this epsilon to be strictly bigger than zero. So it's not um, arithmetically empty if you only take the Fubini Studi metric. And now we come to my theorem. So if you take an arithmetic variety X of dimension D, at least two, so it's the absolute dimension, so, um, the spec Z has already one dimension and uh, so X over the relative dimension of X over spec Z is then uh, one less, it's D minus one. And let L bar be an arithmetically ample Hermitian line bundle on X. So then for every D minus two, D minus two continuous test form phi on X C on, on the complex points of X, it holds the following actually distribution result that again, if we take the average over the small sections of the piece tensor power of L of uh, the difference, absolute value of the difference of the integral of phi over the divisor of S, so, yeah, uh, norm by one over P and the integral over the complex points of phi wedged with C1 of L bar, then then the limit for P to infinity, this is zero. So it's again an assertion about um, almost all sequences because we have a sum of non digitative values getting, getting zero in the limit. Yeah, so for almost all sequences of small sections for the piece tensor powers of L, P is going to infinity, we have an equidistribution of the divisor of the section S with respect to the C1 of L. Yeah, it's, and if you check, it's very similar. It's not re really exactly the same as in the case of polynomials if you apply it to the case P1Z and the line bundle O1 epsilon. So let me give an overview of the proof. So the first thing I want to do is to get rid of the four fiber stock theorem. It's similar to the proof for the polynomials I gave you. Um, well, it's, it's an advantage that we have not to play around with this form phi, which is very arbitrary. So Second thing is there is already some result about equidistribution of, of sections, but it's about random holomorphic sections in complex analysis worked out by Barakta, Coleman, and Marinescu. And it's with respect to certain probability measures on the complex global sections. And the problem is that these probability measures are not discrete. So we cannot directly apply it on on just a subset of uh, small sections, which, which is all just finite. But what we can do is to reduce it, to, our, to apply it to, to the real subspace of, uh, yeah, of, of real global sections in the complex global sections for the probability measures supported on symmetric, compact, and convex subsets. So these symmetric, compact, and convex subsets uh, we call KP, living in the real global sections. And the main example in mind is just takes the uh, real global sections which have supremum norm at most one. So if you bounce the norm, uh, then you get something symmetric, compact, and convex. Um, so we want to go now from, from the real global sections to the lattice points in it. And yeah, the, the integer global sections are just the lattice in the real global sections. And we can decompose the real global sections into, into boxes associated to every lattice point. 
And a result by Moriwaki shows us that um, then these boxes are getting um, exponentially fast small for p is going to infinity. And the other thing we have see that is uh, if you have that's the integral we are interested in is going to zero for p is going to infinity for a sequence of section sp with yeah sub norm at most one which will be always the case for us and then the same holds true for another sequence which the property that the difference of both sequences is going exponentially fast to zero so the supreme the Lim sub uh, for p to infinity of the of the norm of of the difference of sp and s prime p, and then taking the p's root is strictly smaller than one. So I will give more details on this later. It's just an overview. And the last thing is then uh, reducing from almost all sequences in in this um, yeah in this set k p which we've done in, in step three to almost all sequences in um, in the lattice points in KP would will be just a small section because if, at least in our example where KP is given by the bounding the sub norm by, by one. And this can be done by, yeah, just step four and five. We know that we have these boxes associated to lattice points and we know that the box is getting smaller. And if we have, some sequence for sections lying in the boxes, we can reduce it to to the base points of the boxes, boxes which are lattice points. So first, let me speak about getting rid of the form phi by Stokes theorem. So Stokes theorem and the positive et of C1 allows us to compute so the difference of yeah, if we take the integral of phi over the divisor of s and norm by one over p, and the integral of phi wedged with c1l over the complex points of x, this is yeah um, similar to the proof for the for the polynomials. We get that um, this is just phi wedged with the dd bar of the logarithm of s of the the norm of s and again we can use stock theorem to put the dd bar on the other side so we can now put by the triangle inequality for for integrals the absolute value inside and now again the, the absolute value of dd bar of phi can be bounded um, by the compactness of of x and by the positivity of c1 of l by some constant times uh, the constant can be ten, depend on this l and on the phi times the c1 of l bar to the d minus one and thus it's enough to prove um yeah the same result not for the for the absolute value of this difference but for uh, the integral at the end without the constant so the constant is not Important because we are interested in showing that this is zero. So we have to show that the limit of the average over the small sections of this integral uh, tends to zero. Okay, and we have to take this integral good in mind because it will be now the very important um, term for the rest. So let me tell you about the equidistribution distribution result in complex analysis. We use the director Coleman and Marinescu introduced the following condition on probability measures and proved the following theorem. Condition is, they call it condition B. There is also condition A, but it's not important for us because it only uh, matters for yeah, varieties with singularities and uh, if the metric has singularities, well, it's not the case for us. So we take a sequence, a sigma p of probability measures on the space of complex global sections. And we say that there's these sequence of probability measures satisfy b. If for all p, there exists a constant cp such that the following 
um, integral is, is bounded by CP. So we take the integral over the complex sections with respect to the probability measures of the absolute value of the logarithm of the inner product of S and U. So S is a um, complex section and U is also a complex section living in the unit sphere. And you have to say that on the uh, complex sections, we take the L2 product in, in Produced by the metric on L bar. So we have, yeah, so classically the, the L2 metric by the integral of this H of E of S and U, and then we get some product on this complex sections. And yeah, then it also makes sense to speak about the, the norm of U to be one in this L2 norm. And the theorem they gave is. If you have such a sequence of probability measures satisfying B and the limit of this constant divided by P is going to zero, then we have said, yeah, here's this integral we are interested in is integrated over, over the complex sections with respect to the probability measures is going to zero. And now one sees, okay, one is it's possible to apply it if uh, our probability measure is, is discrete, for example, like in our setting where we are interested in the small sections, which are just finally many, then we have the problem that this cannot be true. The condition cannot be true because then for this S, we have only finally many S in the integral will be a sum and so there will always be a U, which is orthogonal to the S and then the, the logarithm of zero is infinite. Yeah, it's not a good idea to apply it to the small sections instead, but we can instead apply it to real subspaces. So we choose a sequence of symmetry, compact and convex subsets KP in the real sections, which are also living as a real subspace in the uh, complex sections. And we may assume that the KP are bounded by balls from above and below and the radius of the balls um, satisfying the following condition that the piece root of them is going to one for P is going to infinity. And an example is for, yeah, as before, we take KP to be the real sections with bounded supremum norm by one. And then one can show that the probability measure defined by taking the Lebesgue measure restricting to the set KP and normalizing such that it has volume one in total, it's settings fine P, and it has the property that the limit of the CP, the constant in the condition B divided by P is going to zero. So we can apply the theorem and we get that, yeah, the, inter the integral we are interested in is going to zero on average, uh, over these KP in the space of real sections. Okay, but that's not really enough. You want to go to, to the small sections, which are just lattice points in the, in the, um, in the real sections. So this, this is a step where I wanted to do this decomposition into boxes. So we had already considered the real sections. And in there, we have the, yeah, the integral sections. And these are just the letters. So it's can directly show it's just uh, one has to check that uh, the integral sections are um, torsion free, but it follows from algebraic geometry. And in these letters, we can choose a basis and we choose a basis SP1 to SPDP. DP should be the dimension of this letters um, of minimal norms. And then it's this result by Moriwaki that um, the norms are then so small that even the, the, maximal, the maximum of all the norms of the base vectors is bounded by a constant times p to the d minus one times the constant to the p, where this constant v is strictly smaller than one. So it's meaning that if p is going to infinity, the norms of the base vectors 
are going exponentially fast to zero. And now let us, for every lattice point x, we define a box. Qx just starting in the lattice point x and then going in every direction of, uh, of the base vectors by, by coefficients from zero to, yeah, to one, but not including one. And that's just looking like um, this is a half open cube in the DP dimensional space. And yeah, the Mo theorem by Moriwaki shows that this box QX is going exponentially fast, small for P going to infinity. And this box is at the property that we get in disjoint decomposition of the space of real sections. The real sections are just a disjoint union of the QX where X is running over all the integral sections. Okay, and now the idea is uh, if we know the equal distribution for the real sections, we know that it's for almost all sequences, the case that we get equidistribution. And um, then these for, yeah, if you take one sequence, the, um, the sections lying in at some point in these boxes QX, and we should reduce it to the base point X of the box QX. And that's what we're doing in the next slide. If we have two near sequences of sections, so we can do it in more general. Let SP and SP prime be two sequences of sections uh, of complex sections. And we assume the following. The sub norm is again bound by one. We always have this. And they are getting exponentially fast near to each other. So the, the norm of SP minus SP prime and taking then the um, piece root um, gives a sequence which has, uh, yeah, the biggest limit point strictly smaller than one. So if we put the, the piece root on the other side, we have said it's smaller than some V to the P as in Moriwaki result. And the third thing is that the sequence SP should satisfy that for the integral we are interested in, the limit is going to zero. And then the question is, is this also satisfied for the other se uh, sequence of section? And indeed, one can show that um, also for S prime P, the integral we are interested in, taking the limit for P to infinity goes to zero. And let me give the idea of the proof. First is prove it just by complex uh, analysis, so we can prove it for smooth projective complex varieties by induction, by induction on the dimension. So the case of the dimension zero is just the base case. And this is easy. It's, yeah, it's not completely trivial, but uh, it's enough, easy enough to do it. Um, one should say that the varieties has not to be have not to be connected. So in the case dimension zero, we have finitely many points, which are, yeah. And yeah, we have the discrete topology on them. And um, a norm on a, of a section is then just association of uh, positive real numbers on, on these points. And now for the induction step, we use Stokes theorem to reduce to a divisor of, sec of a section of a very ample line bundle. Yeah, that's what one can always choose. By Bertini theory, we can always choose if we take a very ample line bundle, a divisor, which is, uh, is smooth, it's in general the case. We can also take this divisor in general, such that um, the SP and the SP prime are again, have only zeros in, in co-dimension one. But that's not enough. One gets an error term. And, but this can be made smaller than any epsilon bigger than zero by choosing the section 
using again the equity distribution theory by uh, by Rakta, Marcom, and Marinesco. So this was the second part. Yeah, and then one can make the error term small and arbitrarily small. So in the end, one gets that uh, that this integral for s prime p is smaller than epsilon for every epsilon. Then it has to be zero. So let's conclude the proof. We have to use also some geometry of numbers, as in the title of this slide, saying. So the idea is start with the uh, subsets in of positive density. So we look at the convex sets Kp and dissect them with these lattice points of, of integral sections. And in there, we just take Tp to be subsets. And positive density means that the, the smallest limit point of the ratio of the number of points in this Tp and the number of points um, in the of, of lattice points in this Kp, so the number of points of integral sections in Kp should be positive. And then it follows that if we look again at the decomposition of the real um, sections, that if we take the volume of the um, of the boxes associated to the points in the Tp and divide by the volume of all Kp, so we also intersect the, the boxes with Kp, then this is um, also positive. So first one should think, okay, let's directly follow, but the, it's a problem because one has to be careful with the points intersecting the boundary, where the box is intersecting the boundary of Kp. So by geometry of numbers, one shows that the boxes intersecting the boundary of Kp does not do not matter. So it's, uh, there's still some work, it's not directly following. So, and then we can take the th third step of our discussion of the proof to show that there is a sequence SP, where SP lying in, in this disjoint union of these boxes intersected with this KP, where the X is uh, from this TP such that the integral we are interested in is going to zero. So this is true because we know in the average over this Kp, this integral is going to zero. And if we restrict to some subset such that the volume is positive uh, in, in ratio to the volume of Kp, then this also has to be almost everywhere to be zero. And in particular, we can choose some to SP such that this is going to zero. Um, and now we can use the fourth and the fifth step to conclude that there is also a uh, sequence SP prime, where the SP prime is in TP. So what we are doing is just SP is um, in the disjoint union of this X, uh, QX with KP. And this meaning this is lying in some QX and we just take this base point X of the box where it's lying in. And this is then the, the SP prime. It's just the X where SP, it's just the X such that SP is lying in QX. And then we know by the result by Moriwaki that the, um, the difference of SP and SP prime is getting small exponentially fast. And then by the fifth step, we know that um, because we have that the integral, the limit of the integral for SP is going to zero, we know it also for the limit of the integral of SP prime. And now we should come back for, um, yeah, to the average sum. And what we can use is that uh, this integral in, in general is bounded by, by our Kirov theory. But at least in this case, where we're interested in um, sections of subnorm at most one, it, it's bounded by the Arkelov degree of the arithmetic self intersection number of, of the line bundle L. And this is not depending on P or on the section. And because this is bounded, we get that 
on average over the lattice points in Kp, the integral is going to zero because if um, if this would be positive, then for a subset of this Kp intersected with a zero of positive density, it should be everywhere positive. And this cannot be this case because such a subset is looking like the Tp at the beginning of this slide. And we showed that in every such as Tp, we can choose one section which is for which the integral is going to zero. So in the end, we conclude that also this uh, average of the integral is going to zero. Yeah, and by the example that, that Kp is given by uh, restricting uh, by bounding the subnorm by one, we know that this is exactly the small sections if we intersect with the integral sections. And yeah, by the first uh, step in the proof, we know that this gives again our equidistribution result when we put in again this, this test form file. Okay, that's all for the proof, and I thank you for your attention.